Hello everybody and welcome to Nathan on Shuffle. Uh, I've got a really exciting episode today. I've been really excited to do this one. I've been kind of teasing it and talking about it for a while. This is my Jethro Tull album rankings. I'm going to go through their entire catalog and rank them from least favorite to most favorite. And I always give a quick disclaimer. I'll try not to say too much here because I know people don't like when I'm too apologetic and give too much of a preamble, but uh, this is only my opinion. These are uh, just how I felt listening through the albums and my order of preference. So I know it's probably not the typical uh, ordering that you might see from like a more professional uh, site or something like that, but this is just me and how I felt listening to it. And this one's going to be a little bit different. I've done several album rankings before. I did a Yes ranking, I did a Dream Theater ranking, a Big Big Train ranking. This is a little bit different because I'm not as familiar with Jethro Tull going in. I was huge fans of those other bands. Um, I knew the kind of classic albums from Jethro Tull, you know, kind of that classic period in the early 70s, but I didn't know about their expansive uh, catalog from before that time and after that time. So a lot of these were I was listening to for the first time and my process is just to go through each of the albums and kind of create an order. Do Where does it fit? Do I like it more or less than the album I just heard preceding it? Uh, I'm probably going to try to go through quickly some of the bottom ranked ones because there's less to say because they're just albums that didn't grab me really um, and then reserve more time towards the end. So I'm going to try to not take too long of a time this, <laughs> this go around but we'll see how it goes. Oh and also I'm ranking 21 albums um, I'm not ranking the Christmas album, which came out in 2003, because I feel like it's, it's kind of a collection of different songs that came out from their career, that maybe some re-recorded versions, a couple of new songs, some kind of instrumentals that are based on Christmas carols and things. Um, so I don't really count that as a true studio album, and it's kind of a seasonal type of album that doesn't fit as much in this. But I do like it, so it'd probably rank somewhere in the middle if I did have to slot it in. And I also didn't rank uh, Ian Anderson's solo records. Uh, someone suggested that maybe I should as part of the rankings here, but I just I, I wanted to focus on the Jethro Tull proper albums and just didn't have time to incorporate all of the uh, Ian Anderson solo records that have come out as well. So uh, maybe I'll. I'll think about adding my thoughts on that later, but for this video, it's just going to be Jethro Tull proper that I'm going to be ranking. Number 21 is Under Wraps from 1984. I just, this one didn't connect with me. Um, I struggle with pretty much any prog band's foray into the 80s is a little bit questionable because I tend to like the 70s sound a lot better as a big prog nerd. Uh, I, I like the progginess and I feel like a lot of bands kind of abandoned that as they went into the 80s and tried to embrace 80s sounds and styles. It's just not really a sound for me. Too much of this kind of 80s synthetic sound and really doesn't have a lot of that classic folky kind of proggy sound that they're known for. So I just, I didn't find much here that I really grabbed me or interested me. Uh, not as much of the flute sound, which is such a signature part of, of Jethro Tull, kind of a drum machine type thing rather than a drummer, which is really off-putting for me. I like kind of the live drum feel. Um, but there's some good songs here. You know, even their weakest album has some interesting things going on. And I liked it even better kind of second time through. The first time through, it just kind of passed me by and I was like, didn't really grab anything from it, but listening again, I was like, okay, there's some interesting things they're doing in the writing here that are somewhat interesting, but it's just overall not for me, um, just because of the sound and style of the time. Uh, number 20 is Rock Island from 1989. You're back on you. Rock Island. Rock Island. Passable hard rock music, and I like the inclusion of the flute. Um, of course, and there's some interesting tracks, but overall this just doesn't doesn't interest me that much. I just feel like there's not much special here. It's a little bit bland. Um, it's just sort of there, and once again, it, it doesn't really leave me with anything memorable afterwards. I think it's one of their weaker albums, especially in this period. Um, but I like some, some things about it. I, I thought 
Uh, there's some tracks towards the end that are actually pretty interesting. The Whalers, Dews, and Strange Avenues, to be specific. Um, so there's some cool stuff going on in, in in the music. You know, I don't want to put down any of these records, but just compared to their other stuff, it just isn't as interesting and isn't as complex and musically inventive, in my opinion, compared to their other output. So that's why it has to rank low here. Um, number 19... This is ranked a bit lower than the, the ratings do on, like, Prague Archives or other sites. Um, 19 for me is Roots to Branches from 1995. Some bad people living further down the valley. And I just, I don't know why, but it just didn't really connect with me. And I know a lot of people kind of viewed this as a bit of a return to form after their more 80s style sound that they had throughout these these records from the late 80s and early 90s um, this kind of blander hard rock sound that they were they were doing and this was kind of their first time to really harken back to kind of their folkier period and bring in some interesting other influences there's some kind of um, eastern world music kind of styles here that give it a a new agey kind of quality, um, which is interesting. And I respect them branching out and doing something a little different, but it's just, it didn't really, nothing really stood out once again. Um, the energy felt a bit lower on this than other things felt, especially towards the end. It got really like, there's a lot of ballads in a row and really slow paced music. I was looking for something a bit more nuanced and interesting. Um, but there are some interesting things there. Um, so it's not all bad. I like the song Valley, kind of a cool cool combination of prog music and world music. Um, I liked Wounded, Old, and Treacherous, I thought was kind of fun, jazzy kind of song. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the kind of talking style vocals, and I know that throughout kind of the later course of their catalog here, Ian Anderson's vocals get a little bit... Uh, difficult and he's not able to sing as much as he was earlier in their career um, so that's something to consider I, I just I, I didn't really find much here that grabbed me necessarily it felt kind of overlong and while pleasant it just was not quite as rocking and fun and as, as exciting as some of their other records so that's why I had to kind of put it a little lower um, 18 crest of a knave from 1987 is my number 18. Um, once again, very 80s style. Just right off the bat, the first song, which I believe is Steel Monkey, uh, just really was jarring to me after listening to a lot of these more organic, folky sounding records. It was just, it was a little bit tough for me to, to kind of grasp onto that. But moving on from there, it, there are some more kind of folk style stuff. And I feel like this is a lot more successful of trying to blend kind of this newer 80s aesthetic with their kind of folkier sounds, you know, compared to Under Wraps, for example, which I don't think did a great job of, of marrying those two worlds and kind of just sacrificed a lot of what I felt is the heart and soul of Jethro Tull. This has a little bit more of that heart and soul, but once again, it's not really grabbing me a bunch. You know, there's certain things that are fun. Jump Start is kind of a fun, uh, folky song that has some interesting uh, Ian Anderson soloing on the flute. Um, I liked Budapest. It's a, probably a bit overlong and kind of this extended ballad, but I kind of like what they're going for there. Um, so there's some interesting things that, you know, they're trying to incorporate some of their classic style into a newer sound. I think it, it's... It's interesting, but it's not an album I'd really return to very much just because the style just isn't quite for me, and I, I just wasn't really grabbed by this one either. Um, number 17 is uh, Catfish Rising from 1991. Um, I kind of view Crest of a Knave, Rock Island, and this album as sort of a trilogy. Um, I think I, I saw it framed that way in a lot of articles and, and things I was reading about these albums. I kind of prefer this one over the other two, just because it has something a bit more unique than the, what those have. You know, those sound a little bit like this bland hard rock sound that they're going for that just doesn't really connect with me as much. But I feel like Catfish Rising, they really tap into this kind of southern bluesy, folky roots 
that they had in their early career, you know, but brought to kind of a new age a little bit. It's it's really fascinating. A lot of these songs like sound almost like a bluegrass or blues flavor to them that I really found interesting. And I kind of like that sound. It's kind of almost a guilty pleasure for me, this kind of bluegrassy kind of sound that, that comes up in these sorts of, of songs. There's I like the kind of inclusion of that. I feel like that brings an added element that makes this more interesting compared to kind of the other albums that felt a bit more boring and samey. I feel like this at least provides something different in the soundscape that that kind of grabbed my ear versus just kind of the same old, same old of those other albums. Um, so really some cool stuff here. A um, little bit more of an organic band style sound compared to some of their other 80s work that came, that preceded this one. So um, that's why this one kind of raises the bar a bit for me. And number 16, uh, jtoll.com from 1999. <laughs> Um, I had a surprising amount of fun with this one. As I was going through them, uh, through, through the albums, this one stood out as one of the first in my, you know, going from kind of the least rated to the highest rated, um, as the first one that really had an interesting, uh, varied sound to it was kind of them being a bit more progressive, being a bit more leaning into their 70s roots and prog stuff again. Um, you know, it's not perfect. It's not a perfect record. It's probably over long. Um, it has a bit of that modern kind of sound that isn't quite gelling as much to their classic side. Um, but there's some fun, upbeat moments. There's some funny things going on. Kind of the, <laughs> it's probably not regarded highly by many, but I actually really liked Hot Mango Flush. I thought it was musically very interesting and the vocals although silly uh, were kind of amusing so i had a lot of fun listening to it um but beyond that there's just a lot of cool um decent songs on it spiral is is a good opening with decent hard rock uh sounds to it i i like the the title track was pretty interesting there's kind of some shorter little tracks spread out that are more you know instrumental and interesting um so I, I, maybe it's not technically as good as some of their other albums that i've been talking about i i don't know you know it's it's tough to judge um, but i just i'm going by feel and the experience i had listening and this was a fun ride for me. I thought it was a lot more interesting and fun. And I'm, I'm always looking for kind of that fun factor in my music that keeps me interested and entertained. And really the worst sin in an album for me is just it being boring and me struggling to get through the entire album, which I felt with some of these lower ranked ones. Um, but this was the first time where I was excited to continue through the record and had a fun time with it. So I thought it was worthy um, to be here at number 16. Which I feel leads us into another a step up here, starting at number 15. Those albums I thought were fairly weak in comparison to what comes um, later in the rankings. So, But uh, now we get into some pretty good albums that I thought were really great. Um, so at number 15, I'm slotting This Was from 1968, their debut album. <laughs> It's hard in these rankings to know where to slot these these debut records or these early records from the band before they really hit it big. And this this is no exception with Jethro Tull, which a lot of people really adore these early records. And sometimes I'm not as big a fan of the earlier records because they're a bit raw. They're a bit like the band not quite dialed into what their sound's going to be. Um, and that's kind of the case here with this was. It's a nice piece of, of history for the band and it's actually a really strong record for them just starting out and like figuring themselves out to imagine this is them at a young age kind of working through what they want to be is kind of a cool thought that they came in the gate with such strong material um, but it's not quite the Jethro Tull sound that I'm really liking you know that comes later it doesn't really have a lot of the folky um, proggy stuff that you'd hear later. Um, but it has a bit of it. You can hear those influences, but it's mostly a blues centered record. Um, but there's some really good pieces here. Baker's Farm is, is a really classic piece that has some great flute playing, um, that kind of shows their blues roots, but that they have ambition beyond that. Um, I liked Move On Alone, I thought was a really interesting track. Um, Mick Abrahams is on vocals on that one. 
Um, there's kind of a horn arrangement. It kind of reminded me of like early Chicago. So it was an interesting sound. And then there's some interesting instrumentals. Serenade to a Cuckoo with some great flute soloing once again. And Dharma for One with a crazy drum solo. So there's high energy. You could tell they're excited as a band and that they're really putting themselves out there. And I think this album fits nicely with the time period and that it's a nice blues record. But ranked a little low here just because of what would come afterwards that I think is a bit better. So um, number 14, uh, this one was hard to rank. The, I feel like these albums we're coming across now are the ones I had difficulty, most difficulty ranking because I know what I like the least. I know what I like the most. And then there's kind of this middle ground of albums that I thought were pretty good. Definitely better than those bottom tier ones. Definitely not quite to the heights of the higher tiers, but decent. And how do you kind of, rank and order these middle of the road albums i'm not sure but at number 14 i landed on the broadsword and the beast from 1982 which i liked more than i expected to i thought okay we're jumping into the 80s here this is gonna be very 80s style it's gonna be off-putting to me because i don't really like that i prefer the 70s sound but I think they really did a great job here of marrying this kind of emerging 80s style and sound with kind of their classic folk roots from the 70s. And so tracks especially like Clasp and, and Pussy Willow uh, really have that kind of classic folky vibe to them, even as they're experimenting and putting in new sounds. And it's not all great, you know, some of, some of that like 80s hard rock kind of style comes through, especially on something like Beastie, which is kind of a stereotypical 80s hard rock style song. Um, but there's character throughout the record that I think is beyond some of those other late 80s, early 90s records that just kind of all blended together for me and were a bit more bland. This had a bit more of a character, had a bit more of the classic sound kind of embedded in. Even if it's not totally classic, it has a bit of that still existing. It's like they're still holding on to that even as they embrace kind of newer sounds through the 80s. So I, I enjoyed this. I thought there was some great moments and overall it was a pleasant listen. So I placed it at number 14. And number 13, maybe high for some, um, but I've been really liking it. Number 13 is their latest album, The Zealot Gene, from 2022, from this year. I've been struggling with where to place this too, and I considered bumping this a few spots lower because as I listen to it more, I, I recognize some of its flaws. You know, even after I gave my review of it, which was fairly positive. Um, I think the biggest flaw is that it's low energy. That there's, especially the big full band songs, sometimes the instrumentation feels a bit rote and feels a bit like passionless and not very inventive. And that can lead to kind of fatigue and listening to it, that it's not very exciting and special. You know, there, there's good songwriting behind it, and there's some good lyrics and some interesting conceptual things going on, but the just the lackluster feel sometimes drags the record down. So that's why some of the band pieces have that kind of side, plus some kind of issues with maybe some of the production and, and just how it was, was uh, mixed and mastered and all that kind of stuff, which I'm not an expert on, but I just, I, the sound of the record has moments that are better than others, but I do like a lot of the acoustic pieces that I think really harken back to that classic Toll sound. That's kind of why I ranked it high is because I think they really were trying to harken back to that classic period that I really love from the band. You know, they were kind of shedding off all of that 80s and 90s aesthetic that they had kind of going on and are harkening back to their classic era. And for some of these pieces, it works for me. You know, some of that, the folkier style stuff with acoustic guitar and mandolin and those kinds of things really work, but some of the other songs can be a bit lackluster. Um, even the title track or Mrs. Tibbetts, things like that, you know, they're fun. They have some good things going for them, some good hooks, some good song uh, craft in some ways. Overall can feel a bit lackluster to me. Uh, that's why it places here. Um, number 12, now we're getting into records that I really like. Um, this is the higher tiers. This album is called A. From 1980, which I actually got recently. It's kind of above my head behind me. 
Um, I got the new Stephen Wilson makes from my dad for Christmas, so I've been listening to that version, which I really enjoy. It's a surprisingly great record, I think. Um, it's from 1980, so it's them dipping their toes in the 80s, but not fully immersing themselves in this like pop sellout 80s mode. You know, it's still them having the progressive influences, and it's kind of interesting because to me with this record instead of them like trying to like to try to reframe themselves as this new 80s band it's it's like them taking some of the styles from the 80s but still having the Jethro Tull essence behind it I anyways you know it, it has that kind of adventurous nature and spirit and progressive vibe and and nature and I really like the addition of Eddie Jobson is on this record I think he brought a lot to the keys and some violin even, which, you know, he was um, a part of the band UK, which was a kind of late 70s period progressive rock kind of super group. And so he adds kind of a prog cred to this album in a sense. And it's just, it's it's really good from front to back. You know, maybe not every track is perfect, but Black Sunday is an excellent proggy song with some strong keyboards and a fast paced feel with some really fast lightning vocals, um, some added violin really gives this album a added layer and dimension a bit more of a proggy feel than some of their 80s albums to come um, more varied and interesting I, I just really liked it i found it really fascinating maybe part partly it can feel a bit dated because of those kind of 80s synth style sounds but overall the music is still fairly complex there's some great playing i know that kind of there's interesting backstory to this one it was really going to be a a solo album from Ian Anderson, um, but then it kind of got marketed as a Jethro Tull album by the record executives and uh, essentially kind of created a new version of the band, um, maybe against their will, because uh, Ian Anderson had brought on a bunch of other musicians and didn't bring in some Jethro Tull musicians and was creating this solo record. And once they decided, okay, this is going to be a Jethro Tull record, kind of left those other members out of it and brought on board these newer members to kind of reform a new version of Jethro Tull. So kind of some history behind it. And it's kind of a weird concept that it, it was kind of meant to be a solo record. So it has a little bit of that flavor. Is it really truly Jethro Tull? But I, I feel like it is. I feel like it has, you know, it has Martin Barr on it playing a guitar and it's just, it's a really great album that really showcases them trying to keep the essence of the band and that experimentation and proggy vibe, but bringing it into a new era, which I think was most successful here compared to their other output that came out later in the 80s and so forth. So um, now we move into kind of, I believe from this point forward, it's all of their older you know, 70s and before albums. <laughs> so you can tell where my tastes lie in that I really appreciate and love the 70s period of the band. That's my my bread and butter. That's what I come to Jethro Tull for. So 11, uh, just barely missing that top 10. And this was hard. Once again, it's hard to rank these. This is Benefit. <laughs> from 1970, a solid early Toll album, kind of the precursor uh, to Aqualung, which of course would be probably their most successful album uh, critically at, at the very least. And it shows them once again kind of developing in their sound and their style, de developing into maybe even a heavier sound than their first two albums and kind of shedding a bit of that early classic blues sound and embracing more of the, the kind of folk stuff and some of a hard rock element. Um, I really like uh, To Cry You a Song is a total classic. I love the acoustic ending of Saucity or Woman. I love the song Teacher, which is on certain versions of the album, but not others. I believe it was included on the US version of the album, but not the UK version, where it was just a, a single that came, you know, separately from the album. It's a great track, a great driving, hard rocking song that's one of their classics. And they have some experimental type things, you know, Sun is kind of a weird song that's kind of going between hard rock and folk rock but there's there's some really cool stuff on this record that I think shows the band really progressing and deciding who they are as a group and and you can hear those influences coming that would be fully embraced on something like Aqualung so it's fun to hear those roots and to hear them kind of gear up towards those things in this album all right at number 10 we've got Stormwatch from 1979 
This this I raised up in the rankings upon future listenings. When I first listened to this, for some reason it just didn't grab me. Maybe I just wasn't quite in the right mood for it or something. But at first I was kind of disappointed with it because I'm like, okay, this is a 70s album. It'll probably be right in my wheelhouse of what I like from Jethro Tull. But I didn't find it quite as strong. But listening to it more, I'm starting to understand the record a bit better and and finding its strengths and what I really like about it. Um, It's kind of a darker album compared to at least the couple that came before it. You know, it still has that folky sensibility, but does it in a little bit of a darker, darker way. Uh, It's darker, moodier album. Reading into the background, Ian Anderson attributed this to the poor state of the British economy during this time period. So um, that's kind of partially why there's kind of maybe a dour mood um, to this one um, in comparison to their albums that preceded it. Really an interesting album. There's a lot of great acoustic folky type elements that I really like. I love the opener, North Sea Oil, kind of captures with a lot of good energy to start things off. Energy stays high with Orion. And then there's some lighter, folkier stuff like with Home. Um, Dunrung Gill is a pleasant callback to kind of the Thick as a Brick era Jethro Tull. And then there's some longer tracks that kind of have those proggy moments like Dark Ages and Flying Dutchman, which keep my interest and are very fascinating throughout. Really great stuff all the way around. I don't know what I was missing the first time around, but it's just, it's really great late period Jethro Tull, you know, for some people, this is kind of their last classic album, you know, um, before they really changed direction in the eighties. It's the last gasp of them kind of clutching this seventies style folky sound that they had going for them in this late seventies period. Um, which I really love as you'll see from some of my top picks. So, uh, really a great album that is just getting better upon repeated listening. And that's kind of an interesting thing about this ranking. In comparison to some of my other rankings I've done, I I heard those albums a lot, so I had a better dialed-in opinion. This one, these kind of rankings are a bit more fluid because a lot of these albums, this was the first time really giving a dedicated listen to. So um, as I repeat listen to a lot of these, I'm sure they'll shift and move because they already did as I listened a couple more times to these records. I did some huge shifts and moves um, in my ranking. So uh, number nine, we'll get into it. This is Stand Up from 1969. Uh, I see a lot of people really highly regard this album. Um, A lot of people consider this like the first true classic of Jethro Tull. And I can understand why. You know, as much as I don't, I'm not as big into the early sound of the band, I think, as some others. You know, I like their sound more when they embrace more of their prog side. But I can't deny that every track is strong and it shows a developing group. And it was really a leap up from this was. You know, this is another uh, step in the right direction towards where they're headed. And there's some great pieces here. Um, Kind of keeps that blues rock kind of backbone, but having them branch out into some other other styles and sounds with that kind of folk and acoustic sound in some of these pieces. Like Jeffrey Goes to Leicester Square, a great happy folk number with flute, which I read was actually played by uh, Martin Barr in this instance. And Bari is is one of their signature pieces. It's an instrumental that's based on a classic Bach piece, but they really bring it into kind of this jazzier sound and style that's just such classic toll. That's kind of a, an essential piece of their catalog, I would say. Um, but they're doing some interesting things. For a Thousand Mothers is a great aggressive kind of heavy rock piece. You know, it's just, it runs the gamut of, of some heavier rockers, some lighter feel, some different sounds, some folky moments, some instrumental stuff. It's just, it's a really a, a good eclectic feel uh, for the band and shows them progressing and it just it works together as a whole piece I think it's just a really strong record from the group that really established them as as a, as a great force in the music industry and led to what was to come later and number eight War Child from 1974 skating away skating And I know a lot of people are very down on this record. These next two that I'm going to mention, I have ranked way higher than most people, I would say. Um, But I just really like this era of the band. 
And so even their what people consider missteps during this time, I still hear those classic elements of the, the albums that I love in this music. Like with War Child in 1974, came after a passion play, which I haven't got to yet because I love passion play. And I feel those influences in the sound here. You know, there's still some of that saxophone sound, but even in the style of some of these pieces, you know, this was more shorter songs and a different framework than, of course, Passion Play. But I still hear those influences, which I really like. And so it, it just really brought a smile to my face listening to this. And I'll agree that the first side of the record is, is substantially weaker than the second side. The second side is like total classics. Um, I love Skating Away um, on the Thin Ice of a New Day. Just perfect song, one of the best in their discography. Harkens back to that classic folky feel of like the early bits of Thick as a Brick. I just, I totally love this song. I think it's just total classic. One of my favorites. Um, Bungle in the Jungle is one of their more fun hit songs that was just, is a really fun rocker. So that's definitely a highlight. Only Solitaire is a beautiful acoustic number. Short, but sweet and really well placed. And then I also like the third hurrah, which is just a big blast of energy and fun. Um, so this side of the record is fantastic. The side A is a little bit more varied. I love the opening track. I think it's actually really strong and interesting. But a couple of the other tracks after it are a little bit weaker. Um, but there's still interesting things, even on these weaker tracks, that keeps me captivated and makes me appreciate it. And it's just, like I said, as a prog fan, I just really love this period of the group. There's some intricate and interesting complex things still in this music. And it harkens back to one of my favorite albums, Passion Play. So I just really like that that nature of it. I think it was meant to be like a film score or something like that. It was supposed to accompany a movie. It was conceptualized as a double album at first, but the film didn't get funded. So that had to be scrapped a bit and it just became a normal standard, standard album. So that could be why it's a little bit scattershot and doesn't quite hang together as well as it could. But... For what it is, I think it's a fantastic album that I really, really enjoyed listening to. I think it's it's one that I would definitely want in my collection and, and be part of, of their classic catalog. So really appreciate that one. And then once again, <laughs> you might be amazed this is this high, but number seven, Too Old to Rock and Roll, Too Young to Die from 1976. Down to London for a weekend of high life. This was the first album as I was listening through in the Prague Archives ranking from lowest to top where I was suddenly blown away and like, okay, this is classic Toll. This is one of my favorites. I love this album. And I know a lot of people are low on it and think it's not so good. And I just don't get it. You know, I think the title is a bit cumbersome, this kind of long uh, title that's hard to say. Like, it's number seven, so there's other albums that are definitely stronger than this um, in their catalog and around that period of time. But I just really like the sound of this. It's, it's folky, there's some rock elements, there's some blues and prog flourishes. Um, but it all comes together in a really cool way. Um, not as like out full on prog as some of their other albums during this time period, but really great sound. And I thought the version I was listening to just sound really, really crisp and clear and good to me. So I just really appreciated it. Just that they're masters at melding this kind of hard rock and folk style together. I really love Quiz Kid, which opens the record. One of the more high energy, aggressive songs, um, but it's really great and really kind of kicks you off the bat with a great track. Uh, Crazy Institution is a really strong folky song. Um, great melody, great fun. Um, I like the title track to it is really a great, well constructed track with a great melody. Um, Checkered Flag is a great highlight towards the end of the record. I just really like all of the things involved in this. I think it's really strong and showcases the band at kind of one of their high periods of their powers and with this great kind of sound that blended hard rock and folk which is really what they're best known for. I think they did it really well here. I, I just I really like it. Uh, I think it's 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 a really good one, and it's kind of a concept album, I believe, based on the story of an aging rocker and the cyclical nature of pop culture trends. So there's a bit of a concept feel to it, so just a really strong record. I really thought it was better than what a lot of people were giving it credit for. And maybe with a lot of these takes of mine that are different than the general consensus, 
I think a large piece of that could be because, like I said, I'm kind of exploring this now and listening to all these albums out of the original context. You know, I might have a different feeling if I was listening in real time as it was released and felt a certain way based on the albums that directly preceded it, expecting it to be something else than it really ended up being. Maybe that would give me a different opinion, and that's why a lot of diehard Jethro Tull fans treat it a little differently because they were around, they know the context, they know the album that came before and after it and and where it fits in their discography in that sort of sense. And so there might have been more disappointment with this album because of that when I'm just listening to them now just in kind of a random order almost. And to me, it stood out as a strong record compared to, you know, I was listening to all these late period albums all in a row. And then all of a sudden this one came through and it was like a shining beacon through all these like kind of late period albums that I wasn't really digging quite so much. So maybe that colored my opinion here a bit, but I really liked it and I stand by it. I think it's a great album. Now we get to the top six, which this was hard. These, I feel like these six albums are all perfect albums. These are great near masterpiece if not masterpiece albums from Jethro Tull. This is the meat of their catalog. This is kind of the heights of what they were able to do in their heyday. So um, it was hard. I moved these around constantly and came across a, a really different ranking than how I originally conceived it. In fact, this one at number six, I originally had it number three and it dropped as I was listening back through to these top albums and it was just a tough tough thing to do and a lot of it I think depends upon my mood and how I feel at the time I'm listening so sometimes I'm in just the perfect mood and it connects with me on another level and sometimes I'm just in the mood for something else and it ends up being a little bit of a chore to get through so it just it, it depends but I do believe that the greatest albums kind of transcend that and you just always connect with and love regardless of your mood or your context just because of that's how special and great they are and the connection you have with them. But anyways, at number six, I have Heavy Horses from 1978. Which, like I said, originally I put it number three because I was really digging this when I first went through these albums. It was like uncovering this kind of hidden gem a prog album that I didn't know existed in a way because I had I hadn't heard this before this project of listening through for these rankings I had heard before the other five that I'll be talking about as the top five So this was the newest one in this group and I was blown away. I'm like, why hadn't I heard this before? It was just such a great record um, very complex very interesting uh, great concepts it's, it's kind of based upon these different animals and kind of the lifestyle of these animals and maybe addressing more of, of life at the time based on these stories about these different animals. Um, so it's kind of an interesting idea. Um, and it's in this folk period. It came right after Songs from the Wood, which really embraced this kind of folk aesthetic. And I feel like this is a good companion piece to Songs from the Wood, which we'll get to shortly. Um, but this is a little bit of the darker darker version in my opinion you know it's a little bit heavier and darker than songs from the wood which is really bright and and really kind of harkens back i think songs from the wood is more the classic older school feel of, of this kind of folk centered music where this is bringing it into a more contemporary style and sound and bringing more of that harder rock edge that they're known for even the vocals like i was noticing on this record Ian Anderson's voice is really gravelly and kind of harsh. Um, and I don't know if that's to do with his vocals, just kind of how they de were developing through time. But it really was noticeable on here for me that he, his vocals were getting a bit more harsh. I take that as kind of being partial to, to this heavier sound and maybe feeling like that was better categorizing the sound for this record. But so many great tracks and the Mouse Police Never Sleeps is a fantastic opening with some stuttering flute skittering acoustic guitar and rich organ tones just a beautiful track um, i love one brown mouse a clever playful song that comes towards the end some great stuff on it the title track is like this kind of extended prog masterwork that i had never heard before really a great track rover is a beautiful track lullaby is a great extended rock song a there was kind of this element to me uh, of 
like gentle giant in this music because of how complex and how like it harkens back to that like classical medieval folky kind of style that sometimes gentle giant goes into and it's just it's a really cool record that embraces that folk sound that they're known for bring it into a heavier direction compared to a lot of the albums that precede it and it just really connected to me you know it could be six it could be three it could be anywhere in this range depending on my mood at the time but for right now my feeling today is that it's number six um, on my ranking number five is minstrel in the gallery from 1975 this is excellent stuff of course i love this album it's it this is one of their more pretty albums i think as a whole in my opinion you know there are some harder edged moments of course there's the excellent opening track the title track which starts with this light acoustic feel kind of almost this kind of classical old school kind of acoustic style and then it gets into this hard progressive stuff that goes on in the music and then like kind of morphs into this hard rock track in one track they're really able to showcase all the feels and styles of the group the kind of folkier elements the harder edge harder rock stuff and the proggy influence all in this first track and i think it's an excellent start to the album it's just it's essential jethro toll music for me um and it continues every track is strong cold wind of valhalla um has some great harder edge to it but also um has that kind of lighter feel as well like a lot of folky influence black satin dancer is is really cool it kind of goes through a lot of moods and and different sections um requiem and one white duck uh, you know more of the laid back kind of acoustic pieces of the album but they're both fantastic i really like that style of the group you know give me just an album full of acoustic folky numbers from Jethro Tull and I'm totally happy listening to that forever so really like that sound and then it ends with this kind of masterwork big prog epic uh, Baker's St. Muse which is one of their best longer extended pieces beyond of course you know Thick as a Brick and Passion Play so it definitely deserves some recognition for its its status as one of these prog prog numbers here um I really love this album it's beautiful it's to me it's one of the more gorgeously produced beautiful albums with a lot of great playing um really really great balance to the album there are some heavier moments I you know I'm kind of neglecting that it's definitely a rocking album as well but I think they really shine on this album in their more acoustic, prettier, you know, moments like those kind of acoustic songs I was mentioning. And a lot of Baker's St. Muse has some of that feel to it as well. So just a really, really great, great album that's just definitely in the top tiers of their catalog. All right, number four, we get into like the classic. <laughs> this is Aqualung. Sitting on the park. from 1971 this is the one a lot of people hold up as like their number one album this is like what Jethro Tull are known for by the masses at least you know and I come in from more of a prog view so I'm gonna prefer their prog year albums in a sense but I can't deny how classic this is and how every track is just masterfully done it's just a staple of of like classic rock music you know it's just it's hard to deny the power of these these songs and what they have accomplished in the classic rock genre as a whole really so as much as i view like thick as a brick which is to come later as kind of their prog masterpiece this is kind of their classic rock masterpiece to me you know and there's little touches of, of some of that prog flavor that would come later in their next few albums but by and large, these are all like radio-ready rock hits that are just really well-crafted. And, it, you know, there's kind of some debate about is this a concept record or not? You know, people were kind of hailing it as a concept record because there was kind of this trio of songs that were dealing with anti-religious sentiments. My God, Him 43 and Wind Up. But the band Ian Anderson has kind of said that it's not. A concept album there's just some songs that are loosely linked and really overall it's not meant to be a concept album but more just a collection of songs where certain songs kind of link and 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 connect to each other but not the whole album really as a concept piece um which is kind of funny because when we get to thick as a brick that kind of informed where they went next by truly embracing the concept album and 
almost doing a concept album because of this situation and saying, well, if you want us to do a concept album, we'll go over the top and, and do our own version of what a real concept album is. And almost in a, in a way of like satirizing the genre in a sense, but you know, that's to come in a minute. So there's some classics here that are just fantastic, super impressive. Aqualung is one, has one of the most recognizable guitar riffs from Martin Barr and so a great solo. It surprisingly doesn't really feature any flute work, which is kind of what they're known for. One of their biggest, most popular songs doesn't have the flute sound, um, which I found fascinating, but it's just, it's a classic hard rock song that really works. Cross-Eyed Mary is just a classic harder edge song. Uh, Mother Goose is a great incorporation of the folk side of the group and the rock side. Um, Up To Me is a great track, which has kind of this heavier rock influence and kind of a minor, minor key riff and dark piano. Uh, Hymn 43 is just a really, really catchy, fun, uh, kind of driving song. Um, I really liked My God. It's kind of an extended piece um, that really works well and features a lot of, of the flute. You know, there's kind of some extended soloing that's really well done and has some great riffs in it as well. It's just every track, when you move from one to the next, it's like, oh, yeah, this track is great. Oh, this track is great too. You know, it just, it shows a big leap for the band from what came before it, that this is them really catapulting themselves into what they have become known for and their dialed in sound. And I really like it and think it's really well done. So now we move to number three, and this is Songs from the Wood from 1977. Um, I love this album. This is a special album to me because my dad, his view of Jethro Tull is somewhat limited, you know, similar. That's why my view was somewhat limited before listening to all these albums. Um, He really is just kind of a thick as a brick fan and that's kind of where it ends. But he said, there's actually one other album that I've really uh, grown to appreciate. And that's this one, Songs from the Woods. So he gave me a copy of it and it was the first foray into anything beyond Thick as a Brick from Jethro Tull. And I'm like, this is great stuff too. You know, it has some great proggy moments, but it's mostly kind of this cool folk style record that's kind of harkening back to this kind of classic folk sound. I really appreciate the kind of feel of it, that it has this kind of classical influence almost as well, like on a track like Velvet Green, which I really love, kind of has that renaissance kind of fair feel, similar to like something Gentle Giant does a lot, kind of blending this classical and folk rock kind of sound. Um, but every track is strong. I love the title track. It begins with kind of these acapella vocals that bring you into this world. It's like they're kind of chanting in this middle of this woodsy forest, you know, bringing, evoking this certain feel and, and kind of back to the earth and, and just kind of like you're out in, in nature. And I just really like that feel to it. I think they really succeed in making you feel like you're out in the woods in this woodsy environment. I really appreciate the album. It just, it never dips in quality. Every song is strong. I love the title track, like I said. I love Jack in the Green. It's just a simple flute and guitar number that's really strong. Yeah, I love the track Cup of Wonder was one that stood out to me as a fascinating great track that's high energy and fun but still sticking on theme with this kind of folkier old school aesthetic so I just really really like the record I think it really holds together really well it has this very central theme and and vibe that I think I'm always looking for that when I'm looking at what albums are better than others I'm looking at albums that you know they don't necessarily need to be conceptual but they need to feel like they work together as an album. Like this is a complete piece of music, not just a bunch of disparate songs that have nothing to do with each other. And so I feel like Jethro Tull actually does a really great job with this overall, that they really dial into a specific feel for each album. Even if it's not a concept album, there's definitely a unifying feel to the music that's on that particular album that gives it almost a conceptual feel, even if it isn't a concept you know, that I think Ian Anderson kind of writes that way and develops these albums as entire pieces of work. And I think that just makes them that much stronger. So moving into number two, I'm a prog guy, so I have to place this high because it's when they truly embrace their proggiest side. Number two for me is a passion play from 1973. There was a rush 
Allah. And it's funny, kind of looking at the background and history, um, looking at other people's rankings, looking at people talking about these albums. Some there's a big divide. I think a Passion Play is similarly ranked high amongst the prog people like me. You know, I think us prog fans can really understand what they were going for here and really like all the different things that are they're doing in the music and the variety and, and all of that stuff. But I think a lot of other people view this as a total disappointment in their catalog, that this is one of their worst records. I was looking at an article that went through all of their whole catalog, basically, and talked about each album and kind of how they feel about it and where it sits in their discography. And they basically just wrote this one off as like, okay, this was a total misstep. They didn't know what they were doing. This was totally didn't work. And they had to course correct afterwards. But for me, this is where the band is their most adventurous, their most... Um, exciting they're most rocking you know this is just such an underrated album it's so well crafted it has so many cool sections it just is relentless it just goes through so many different morphing styles and things it's it's like the darker kind of messier version of thick as a brick really but i i kind of like that there's some more jazzy elements um there's a saxophone element that's added into the mix but there's still the the classic flute lines from from Ian Anderson that are still ever present. There's some harder rock vibes. I feel like especially in the second half towards the end, it really kind of gives you some really classic rock riffs to kind of end the album on. It has a really crazy kind of cool concept of like detailing this afterlife experience. Um, it's just, it's a really cool album that tells a cool story and that I really love from start to finish. I just had the biggest smile on my face listening to this again because it's just a total classic to me. I love every minute of it. The only thing that maybe mars it slightly is the whole uh, Hare Who Lost His Spectacles story, which I find amusing and fun, but don't feel necessarily like I have to listen to that every time. You know, it's kind of a skip track for me a little bit because as fun and amusing as it is, I don't need to hear that over and over again. I prefer to just hear the music and the rest of the album, but it's kind of a fun uh, deviation and something just amusing to hear in their catalog. This kind of bizarre, like um, Peter and the Wolf type story that just is stuck right in the middle of this sprawling progressive epic. But it's really fun, and I really love this album with my whole heart. I think it's a fantastic piece of music and just really has always grabbed me since I very first heard it. And I don't understand sometimes why it's not viewed on the same level as Thick as a Brick. To me, these one and two picks, because obviously my number one is going to be Thick as a Brick, are like neck and neck from <laughs> my perspective. I think they're both excellent and kind of two pieces to the progressive, the true progressive nature of Jethro Tull in this um, two year span where they were just an ultra progressive band. And maybe in some ways they're kind of making, poking fun at the progressive rock genre is kind of partially what they're doing. But at the same time, they're creating classic progressive rock records. So um, I, I just totally adore these records. Um, so number one, obviously, is Thick as a Brick from 1972. And there really can be no other. This is just their total classic. Like I said before, it's their progressive masterpiece. It's it's kind of them satirizing the progressive rock genre, but to satirize the progressive rock genre in such a way that you become one of the highlights of the progressive rock genre is such a move that I think is just one of the more fascinating pieces of almost all of prog history. You know, that this is viewed by many as one of the top five greatest prog albums of all time, but it generated from them trying to kind of make poke fun at the genre itself. You could dive into the psychology of, of that, of how progressive rock people view music and why this thing that was meant to be a satire ended up becoming one of the biggest albums of the genre. It's just, it's a fascinating thing. Um, kind of inspired by Monty Python. Uh, the concept is this epic poem written by a 10 year old prodigy in the fictional town of St. Cleve. Um, there's this big like newspaper that comes with the record that you could read and that kind of gives you more ideas of the concepts and what's going on in the record. But it's just, it's a great album musically. It just morphs and moves from one theme to the next. But it, it just is structured so well. It, it returns back to a lot of the main themes. Um, I love the production style. It just sounds so crisp and clear. You can hear that acoustic guitar. Just, it's, it's 
that opening section is just so classic and always grabs me whenever I hear it. Just the, the acoustic guitar and flute and the vocals. Just it's it's totally beautiful. And then it moves into this kind of rocking section and it just morphs and moves along and it just never lets up and every section is just as is strong if not better than the section that preceded it there's some great power from the Hammond organ but some great beautiful strings that are brought in to accentuate these different sections and once again it's a great molding of the folk side of the band and the prog side with a little bit of the hard rock elements it really has it all and to me is, is the best for a prog fan the best encompassing of their entire sound and what they were trying to achieve as a group musically and so I, I wish they did more of these long sprawling concept records in the 70s because these two records just really are prime jewels in my collection of prog music and just essential uh, for me and, and my love of the genre. So just an incredible, perfect masterpiece of an album that I just totally love. And me and my wife reacted to part one and it was just such a joyous experience. And Jana actually really enjoyed it a lot. You know, I was worried that it would be too long and too varied and, and wouldn't really capture her attention, but just goes to show strong music is strong no matter what. And she really loved it. And I think um, that really speaks to its strength and its power, that it's such a great piece of music that even someone like my wife, who's not super into Prague, can really appreciate what's happening in the music. So there we have it. That is my rankings. Hopefully you guys appreciated that. Uh, I know there's a few choices that are a little bit wonky compared to the traditional rankings that I was looking up, but uh, I don't think it's too far off the grain. And I just hope you guys appreciate what I am doing here. This was a lot of work. You know, I had to listen through all these albums and I ordered it and reordered it. I took a lot of notes. I really wanted this to be a good show and to really capture the essence of the band. So I hope I did that in some small way. And hopefully you guys are still with me on the journey and were able to complete it. And thank you guys for listening and thank you guys for watching my videos. Hopefully you guys found something to enjoy here. Please give me your thoughts of Jethro Tull's discography. What are your rankings for their albums? How do you feel about mine? Did I get it wildly wrong? Thank you guys. I hope you guys continue to enjoy the music out there. And I hope to catch you guys in another video. Um, thank you guys so much and I'll see you guys later. Bye.